What do you think the role of music and art is in social movements? It's always had a major role. Uh, so in the 60s, for example, although I'm a kind of old-fashioned conservative, I had tried to keep away from it, but uh, you know, rock music, uh, Bob Dylan, uh, all these things were very inspiring to a lot of young people. And if you go, the uh, same, same here in Ireland. So uh, uh, mural art, for example, was a very significant part of the uh, activist movement. And uh, that's every popular movement in history that I know anything about. For years, when I'm asked to sign things after a talk, uh, the one that was at the top of the list was a uh, punk record, uh, which was in uh, 19, must the first Gulf War, 1991 some punk group, group with a name I couldn't resist, it was called Bad Religion, uh, asked me to talk for eight minutes into a tape that they sent me just about the war. So I talked for eight minutes and uh, sent it back to them and back came a record, you know, small records with uh, my boring talk on one side and uh, a song on the other side which they assured me was an anti-war song. tail out of it, but I gave it to a friend who had a 14-year-old daughter, and she wrote me a very eloquent account of what it meant and where it fit in the punk scene and so on, so you know, I've had some connection. But in the end, I think I, uh, I'm i still first and foremost a blues man in the life of the mind, first and foremost a jazz man in the world of ideas. And what I mean by that is always keeping track of the unjustified suffering in the world the unnecessary social misery, keeping a limelight on the plight and predicament of what Franz Fanon called the wretched of the earth. How do we broaden the scope of human dignity? I that, picked that's up. what I'm after. Uh, uh, trying to keep alive again uh, this democratic socialist ideal, which is more the name of a desire for justice than it is the name of a system. And it's hard to communicate to Americans uh, the, the sense that this is a radical democratic view that accents the role of working people and poor people, of marginalized people, of gay and lesbian people, of peoples of color, of disabled, physically challenged people, all those who have been in some sense devalued by those who are viewed as normal, mainstream. And it's not PC chit chat because we're talking about some very, very scarred, bruised uh, human beings, but they're not simply victims, they're agents in the world. It's John Coltrane. Hard to even mention his name, given the depths of his spirituality and artistic virtuosity. And uh, Here he the is, album, 1959, 60 Giant Steps, just after he had left Miles' uh, quartet and formed his own quartet, is one of the heights of, um, I think, cultural life in American civilization in the 20th century, actually. Now, you've mentioned Coltrane many times in the book. Yes, indeed. And Chekhov. Absolutely right. First, why Coltrane? You, you talk about you're going to teach Coltrane. Absolutely right. I'm writing a book on Chekhov and Coltrane, actually. But Coltrane, for me, is a, uh, a culminating figure in a very rich tradition of blues and jazz. A blues that injects a blue note into Western history, into Western musical harmony, a, a note of dissonance, disturbance, defiance, wrestling with darkness, but always sustaining a sense of endurance and stamina rooted in a deep love of self and a love of others. And be it a Ma Rainey, be it a Billie Holiday, a Sarah Vaughan, a Miles Davis, the Thelonious Monk, or John Coltrane, you have this story of a people who up against institutional terrorism, slavery, Jim Crow, lynching, police brutality, steal forge a sense of self with integrity and dignity. That's what I hear in John Coltrane. Here, here's a little bit more from this album, and John Coltrane died when? He died in 1967. He was 40 years old, same age as Franz Kafka, actually. And, and what are you hearing right here? Well, here you get the lyrical, the kind of a deep lyrical, uh, it was what he, he, he vocalized as a European instrument, the saxophone, but it's expressing both a spirituality rooted in black struggle, but reaches out for the struggle of others, be they in Russia, be they in Kurdistan, be they in Greece, be they in Guatemala, be they in Chile. One has to be silent in the face of that kind of depth, actually. Did you ever know him? No, I never did. 
I, I, I have access to the tradition, you know, the same tradition of uh, uh, that, that links one to and the popular level of uh, Curtis Mayfield just passed, uh, Stevie Wonder, Wynton Marcellus. And you're going to uh, teach him? Yes. But as Harvard. a historical figure, that is to say, as somebody who represents something that is both quintessentially American and quintessentially African American. Do that. But the important thing to keep in mind, though, is that historically, of course, enslaved Africans were not allowed to read. It was against the law. So we brought the rich oral traditions of Africa We with the drums, which themselves were also outlaw, but we began to clap. And at the same time, we were exposed to European instruments or brought African instruments so that early on in America you get this original indigenous form of cultural expression in spirituals, blues, jazz. But now that we've been, to act, now that we've been able to gain the right to read after, uh, after the Civil War, we've gone on to produce a very rich literary and intellectual tradition. American culture is one much newer, of course. You know, it's just been around since 1776 in terms of the nation state. And we have a flow of immigrants who are Americanized, but bring with them very rich baggage, but at the same time have to learn how to adjust and adapt to the new American ways. And as Eugene O'Neill, our greatest playwright, pointed out, that we tend to be a people who think we can possess our souls by possessing commodities rather than digging deep in our souls. This is why the blues and jazz is so very important, you see, because it's one of the few examples in American civilization where it doesn't believe the hype about the melodramatic, sentimental stories of the happy ending, nor is it cynical. It tries to tell the truth about America, but also sustain the possibility of America. Now, the second person I mentioned, because he also is mentioned quite often, actually more often than Coltrane, is this man right here. Exactly. Anton Chekhov. Who was he? Yeah, he died at 44 years old in 1904. He wrote uh, Three Sisters, I think the greatest play of late modernity. First performed January 1901, the first month of the century. I still hold the century begins in 1901 rather than 1900. But Anton Chekhov is, uh, I think, um, the towering literary figure of, the, of, of late modernity. And what I mean by that is, is that what he actually is able to do is to force us to wrestle with inescapable disillusionment, disappointment, disheartenment, and yet still be able to like Coltrane, compassionately endure, to look the nullity of who and what we are, to look the absurdity of, of so much of our history, and still sustain ourselves as struggling, shuddering, suffering agents in the world. I first read Chekhov when I was 19 years old, and I could see he had a blue sensibility. How do you keep keeping on with love and compassion with some sense of justice toward all, but you're wrestling with levels of disappointment and disillusion that will never let you go. America. Earlier when we opened up with some theme music uh, from John Coltrane and this, yeah. this uh, you knew, I did not show you this in advance, you knew this was 1959. Oh, yeah. Do you have everything he's ever Oh no, recorded? Coltrane was so prolific. Yeah, it's like trying to read all of Tolstoy, you know, you spend a lifetime, but I mean the peaks. And most importantly, it's not a question of how much, but it's how deeply you have internalized his sensibility. Do you collect music? Do you listen yeah. to music? Yeah, I do. I do. I mean, listen to a variety of music. Coltrane, of course, is at the center. But it's the, I, I carry Coltrane around with me every day, the way I carry Chekhov around with me every day. And it's linked not just to the music as some ornament, some art object, but it's got to become part of your soul. You know, when Chekhov says, I wake up every morning squeezing the slave out of me so that I will have the uh, real, I uh, have running in my veins the blood of a real human being. You see, that's, that's Coltrane and Chekhov. You see, yeah. I, I'm someone who, like a jazz man, is improvisational, experimental, pulling from a lot of different traditions. So people say, well, how could you talk about Ralph Waldo Emerson and Louis Armstrong in the same vein? Well, they're both experimental. When you go back to your class for a second, when you are, yeah. what lecture in your classes do you find them on the edge of their chair? Which, is there one more than the others? Probably the music lecture. And it's primarily because music in the lives of young people, for many, is the last form of transcendence. From it's their bebop, fundamental from form of bebop to uh, rap. Is that the well, thing? no, we go all the way back from uh, work songs of slaves through spirituals, through blues, through jazz. How long do you lecture rhythm on this? and blues. We, I have uh, a week lecture, two hours. 
Uh, two, two hour hours. lecture. Yeah. And you get yeah. the most interest. And of course, we hear the music itself. You know, you turn on Billy Holiday to sing about strange fruit, the southern tree is bad, that American institution of lynching, and the students are. Cold train blows Alabama, the students. Listen to Monk play Ruby by Deer. The students say, wow. A lot of them don't know. Black or white or red or yellow or whatever, they don't know, you see. And by the time you get to Prince, all of a sudden they're ready to move because they have some acquaintance, you see. But you say, well, this is a rich tradition, you see. The Isley Brothers are inseparable from Billy Eckstein, inseparable from Johnny Hartman. This is a tradition with a variety of different voices, you see. But it's rooted in craft, technique, discipline on the one hand, and wrestling with the dark side of America on the other, pain, suffering, grief, oppression, domination. And how is this all organized? Through our political sphere, right? That's who decides, um, you know, we have a right to privacy right now. We didn't always have a right to privacy. It used to be the case where, you know, my, I could call my wife, let's say my wife is saying a therapist, I could call my wife's therapist and say, hey, what's going on? What did my wife say at, the, her, uh, at her appointment? Now we have HIPAA, right? Uh, which is like, you know, I can't find out your health information, right? There's a right to privacy. Say it used to be the case that parents used to be able to call the teachers in college and find out, uh, you know, is Billy Bob coming to school every day? And the teacher would say like, oh, yes, he's attending school. Or no, he's not. You can't do that now because of FERPA, right? We have a right to privacy now. We always didn't have a right to privacy. I'm going to write a book, probably in a few, it's going to be my third book. I'm going to write a book on Louis Brandeis because um, he cooked up the right to privacy. He thought of it, the right to privacy. is like, you know, the only way freedom works out is if we have a right to privacy. And then he made enough arguments and it stuck. And now we have a right to privacy. And he did that 100 years ago. Like, not that long ago. And now we have entire institutions built on the right to privacy. So what are the other rights that we need? Um, I'm going to need your help in getting the American populace to understand that we need, for example, legal care for all. Because it's not obvious that you can be a nation of laws, but still restrict access to lawyers. Right? Because right now we're a nation of laws, but in order to get a lawyer, you need to have money. Or they need to be willing to take a risk on you. So um, is that do you really have rights if you don't have access to a lawyer? I'm not sure you can. So maybe we need legal care for all on the model of health care for all, right? And if we can do it with one prestige position, doctors, we can do it with another prestige position for lawyers. And think about how much free everyone um, would be if everyone had access to a lawyer if they needed one. Same with access to a doctor if they needed one. And you could say like, well, you know, if everyone had access to a lawyer, there would be um, masses of people, poor people, clogging up the courts with their rights claims. That is true. That's also a bad argument for denying poor people their rights. <laughs> so um, these are, this is the work of adults, trying to figure out how to organize society that sustains self-determination for everyone. And that means self-determination insofar as people can make plans and enact them. And in order to make plans and enact them with other people who are basically dangerous but can be acculturated into enabling your freedom, one, you have to give them something to work with. It means you have your responsibility to be decisive. Don't let anyone tell you that you have no responsibility to be decisive. You have to be decisive. Because if you're not decisive, other people don't know how to be friends with you. Just think about all of the indecisive friends you have and how that you're kind of hostage to their indecisiveness. And you don't want to be that person. You also have to own, you need integrity. And integrity simply means owning previous decisions. That doesn't mean you're wedded to them, that, that you have to stay what your previous person said. But it means that you have to admit that your previous person made that decision and we need to grow from there. Right? So you need some sort of integrity. That means owning your previous decision. Also, you need to be open with your communication. You need to be honest with yourself and honest with other people so they know how to accommodate you. A lot of people are not honest with themselves. And, and they've been acculturated into not being honest with other people. And maybe they've even been taught to not be honest with other people because of, uh, for a reason I'll talk about later. So you need to be honest with yourself and with other people, and you have to be open to um, other people being honest with you and changing accordingly. Right? So I think we walk out, we march, we march for three demands. Hazard pay for the people who essential employees who are working, a federal job guarantee uh, for all Americans starting at $20 an hour with replacement pay as you're in quarantine. And uh, lastly, healthcare, right? So we walk out, we march, that's what we're marching for. And if we don't do that, then 
like workers don't have any power. Our only leverage is that we are vectors of disease. Right? And we have to make it be known that we are perfectly willing to continue working, staying at home in place, but our working conditions in this safety factory need to be renegotiated. And if we start doing that, I think there needs to be a march on Washington. And if we start doing that and then like encourage wildcat strikes, safety strikes on other monuments with these three demands, you can't go out there without demands or demands that will be misinterpreted. So send this video out to everyone else because everyone needs the arguments with these, dem these three demands. Has it paid for the essential workers? Because Congress is sheltering at home, but I just went to Walmart and those people are like, just we just decided they're expensive, uh, expendable. They should, they should have the same safety as Congress. Uh, so we need hazard pay for those working. We need a federal job guarantee for those who can't work or have been laid off or just everybody and um, with replacement play as they stay in quarantine. And then lastly, we need universal health care. Those three demands, that's what we walk out for. And let me tell you something about the idea that Congress has given themselves a holiday till May 4th. That's a choice, right? They chose to run back to wherever they are and stay in their mansions and not McMansions, actual mansions, because um, they just they bailed out the people they really care about. We gave the corporate bailout. We bailed them out. We gave them security. We gave them safety. Now that we can, in their plans, now we can go and, and have a holiday in our enormous houses. Right? That's what Congress did. They could have gone the other way. They could have said, well, we need to be safe and shelter in place, but let's sequester in Washington, and we're essential employees. We just got hey, thank you. We just scuttle back. Uh, we just scuttle back and forth. This is what happens when you work at home. We just scuttle back and forth from our little apartments we have in D.C. to the Capitol as we work out a bailout that's appropriate to, um, appropriate to the citizens of the United States. So that's a choice that Congress made. Congress made a choice to bail out those people they care about while, leave, <laughs> while leaving everybody else in a lurch. And um, it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. But we have to fight for it. And I will tell you, if you, hold on, if you, if we go on a march, I will tell you, I will be there. This isn't some, well, she won't be there. Um, uh, but I will be there and I will speak my truth because, speak my truth. No, and then I might have to stay at a hotel for a few days before I come home. But um, I will speak my truth. And I think it's just the only leverage we have because, you know, sheltering at home, you can't actually exert any power that way. None of your petitions matter. And, and that's... I, I am a <laughs> And that matters um, for, uh, for our freedom. All right, so I need, to fin I need to close this out, and then we will, uh, I don't know. Play. Listen to it. <laughs> well, no, we'll just play some violin or something. All right, so... Um, I, have to do, I have to clean up my room, then I'm going to do capoeira. You're going to clean up your room, then do capoeira? Sounds good to me. All right. So um, we need a march. The general strike won't work because it's pushing all the, the political responsibility onto the a small class of the most vulnerable people in America. We need a march. We need to weaponize. We need to be willing to not cooperate with a government that's not willing to fund the mandate that it's given us to stay at home. So this is non-cooperation with the stay-at-home order. I'm encouraging it with a purpose and be clear about the purpose. You can't just go out willy-nilly and, and, no, we need a federal job guarantee. We need hazard pay for those essential workers, and we need health care. And the Congress that has succeeded in giving themselves the next three weeks off and their mansion, we need them back working for us uh, before we pretend that we're going to do what they want us to do. I hope this is, and if we, yeah, I hope this has been helpful. Really ticked about Congress. They totally could have decided to sequester themselves in Washington and just scuttle back and forth like Kroger employees from work to their little apartments they have in Washington and actually work this out for the nation. But instead, they just decided to go back to their McMansions. And that, or not McMansions, mansions. And that is sorely disappointing. The problem, uh, you know, the problem with the Marxist left is they don't un they don't understand the way of life is more important than life. So the idea that I got another kid on me now. Um, so the idea that uh, that freedom is and your way of life is more important than actually sustaining life doesn't actually s doesn't get them, doesn't doesn't penetrate, and that's why they're going to be ruled by the right, who's actually gets that you have to threaten life or be willing to threaten life 
if you're going to uh, take power. And if you're not willing to threaten life to take power, you're going to end up working for the people who are. You see, it's one thing to tell the truth on the outside. It's another thing when you get inside with the constructual constraints and you recognize that if you say certain things, you might lose your job or get, be ca cast in such a way mm. that you no longer are effective within those circumscribed contexts. That's what the electoral political system is, you see. And we'll have more time to talk about that mm. as well, you see. And that's what they're in. Mm. So they like Adam Clayton Powell. They're like Brother Harold Washington. Brother Willie Brown, to be inside of that system. And Brother Willie will tell us, boy, you can suffocate in that, oh, can't you? <laughs> Ooh, can't you suffocate, though, brother? Oh, because the permanent government is always big business. They always already there. They know you rotating. They not rotating. <laughs> I remember we broke out next for David Dinkins and, and had the first meeting. I said, Brother David, uh, you know the permanent government is going to be coming at you. That's Wall Street. What you talking about, Brother West? You'll find out. <laughs> Oh, no, I'm, I'm mayor of New York City. Come on now, man. No, 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 no. Luther Vandross is the real mayor. <laughs> he the one that got the freedom. You locked in. You locked in. But we're going to put pressure to, to give you some more space so that working people and poor people's interests and principles can have more resonance and have more gravity in that way. You see. And so it is, I think, in terms of, uh, of, of where we are now with these four sisters. They, to me, have been exemplary in their courage, and they're so young. Mm -hmm. Good God Almighty. Yeah. Yeah. They're so young. They have to deal with those vicious lies where their very lives are at stake. Mm. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and someone just got here just a few years ago, a few decades ago, in the United States from a blessed country named Somalia. Mm. Somalia has produced some great, powerful figures. There's another with Sister Omar. Mm -hmm. Puerto Rico, oh my God, what's happening in Puerto Rico right now? Right, right. Puerto Rico's still a colony. Abisos Campos, daughter just died, Laura just died two, two months ago. Raising up, hitting the streets. America has a colony? You don't say. <laughs> Where do you think Philippines was? Where do you think Guam was? Where do you think Cuba was? Where do you think Samoa was? Where are we right now? It used to be Mexico. How do you think we got it? Socratic dialogue. <laughs> I mean, one of the grimmest moments in the history of this empire. We've got to be very honest about that. Mm. Mm. It's unclear rather the whether the fragile experiment in democracy can survive. Mm. You see. What I mean by that is not just rule of law, but democratic sensibilities and sentiments being cultivated by the citizenry. Mm. And more and more the message is survival of the slickest mm. Mm. and the strongest, mm. which is a diametrically opposed notion of the tradition that produced me, which is one of you will be hated, respond with the deepest forms of love. You will be traumatized, respond with the deepest forms of healing. You will be terrorized for 400 years, respond with a commitment to freedom, which means you're not in it for popularity. Mm. You don't want to put us, slap your grandmama in the grave by telling her that you succumb to the gutter mm. rather than held up certain bloodstained banners of freedom, integrity, honesty, generosity, and truth telling. And the condition of truth is always what? to allow suffering to speak. Yeah. Mm. There is no truth in the human condition unless we listen to those in the language of Malcolm who are catching hell. Mm. And that's the exact opposite we see in the White House and so many state houses, but not just in politics. Mm. We've seen it more and more in our churches, yeah. well, in our mosque, well. in our synagogue. We've seen it more and more in our educational institutions where corporatization, commodification, Commercialization, money, 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 status, 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 power, power, power. And what kind of sign does that send to the, our young people? Well, Thank God when I was coming along, we had ministers, professors, we had politicians that said they would rather be in the language of the great Mary Ellen Pleasant. You all know who Mary Ellen Pleasant was now. The mother of human rights in California, right? The first black woman who was a multimillionaire. She was worth $647 million in the 1840s. Okay. 
I'm going to say that again. <laughs> Mary Ellen Pleasant, before Madam J. Walker. Ooh. She married a vanilla brother who dropped dead, and she beheaded it the Monday. <laughs> That'd be $647 million a day. She had it. What did she do? She gave a million dollars to John Brown. He was the vanilla brother who loved black people more than many black people loved themselves. That's right. A million dollars to John Brown. Deal with the Underground Railroad. Here's the cash. I'm a real estate magnet. Take the money. Ooh. That's Mary Ann Pleasant, San Francisco. That's it. You see, San Francisco. But she is one moment in a larger tradition. Some folk have less money and say, take my service. Take my time. Take my energy. I'm going to focus on little Jamal. You focus on J Jamila. I'm going to focus on Susan. You focus on Jose. And one of the wonderful things about the tradition that produced we black people is that when the love is deep enough to start on the chocolate side of town and it's real, right. it spills over to the vanilla side. But sometimes but people struggle with that. But it doesn't start there. Because mm -hmm. that's the last thing you need is black people who love everybody but, but black people. Yep. That's, That's the last it. thing you need. But if you love black people deep enough and it's real and concrete, then it's going to move to the barrio. It's going to move to the reservation with indigenous people. It's going to move to the Irish and the Jewish and the Polish because that love is something that is inside of you, something that you have experienced at the deepest level. So you, you referenced, because I know you are a lover of music and... Uh, your uh, album and the song you did with Prince, Mr. Man. Oh, but we miss Prince. Right. Oh, we miss Prince. Oh, and Lord. and this, yeah. this line in here, mm. listen, ain't no sense in voting. Same song with a different name. Might not be in the back of the bus, but it show feel just the same. Ain't nothing fair about welfare. Ain't no assistance in AIDS. Ain't nothing aff affirmative about your actions till the, the people get paid. Mm. And all this discussion back and forth about voting rights and whether young people feel like it's worth voting with everything that's going on, how do you change that line? Ain't no sense in voting. Yeah, and that Prince, Prince's genius is beyond description, but he's wrong about that particular line. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. But we don't, we don't, we don't want to confuse the... Uh, the forest from the trees, because Prince is one of the great exemplars of the freedom that I'm talking about. Uh, and you all know he wouldn't allow any of the hip-hop artists to sample his music. And so when we went in to ask him to do that, he said yes, and it was really quite a uh, blessing and an honor to do that. But Prince also was influenced by another genius named Larry Graham <laughs> of uh, Sliding Family Stone and Graham Station. What was the name of his group? The, uh, Graham Central. Graham Central Station. That's it, Graham Central. I don't overlook that Central. That Central <laughs> Station. And both of them Jehovah Witness. Mm. You see, so Jehovah Witness got their own sensibilities. Michael Jackson grew up Jehovah Witness. One of the greatest of all black geniuses in, in the last 50 years. Ken Gamble. Gamble and Huff grew up Jehovah Witness. And they don't believe in voting. It's just like Nation of Islam for many years didn't believe in voting until Brother Jesse ran, right? So you got, we got certain groups in our community that we push and try to hold accountable. We have conversations and dialogues with them, and many of them don't believe in electoral politics. Mm -hmm. And I think they're wrong about that. I think we have to use all forms of weaponry. Yeah. Mm. We've got spiritual, moral, political, economic forms of weaponry. But we also have to be honest and candid and tell ourselves and others the truth. You see, we can't think that, we can't argue our politicians <coughs> are going to be agents of salvation. That's a lie. That's a lie. Our politicians cannot be as free given the structural constraints. They can be forces for good, but they cannot be as free. So yes, we must vote, but we don't vote for mayors. So when my dear brother was mayor of San Francisco, the last thing you ever want to say to people, to black people, is I'm the Messiah. I'm going to bring you salvation. Is that right, my brother? No, Absolutely. <laughs> you say, I'm a human being in here, and I'm swinging. And I got to make decisions, and forces are coming at me, and interests are coming at me, and I need your support, not just on the inside, but on the outside. Sometimes you agree, sometimes you disagree, but don't pose me as some messiah. Hmm. No, if you need that, go to your church and make sure the messiah is not your pastor, but <laughs> bigger than your pastor. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. You see? Mm -hmm. So in that way, what Prince was simply saying was, Given my perspective, no one perspective of any of us has a monopoly on truth. He said, but you notice 
a lot of times when you do support some of these politicians, things don't change too much. Mm. That's what Prince was saying. Mm. That's real. So we got to say that to the young folk. Recognize that voting is just one moment in your arsenal that has to do with how you can be a self-respecting, self-determining, free human being. Mm. Not just successful, but great. Who's checking the boxes for you right now in terms of presidential candidates? Oh, good question, good question, good question. Very good question. Well, the first thing is, you know, you don't want to fetishize any of the candidates. And by fetishize, what I mean is ascribe magical powers to them. Hmm. You see, the last thing we need to be would just be spectators who watch the horse race and vote and thinking we made a major contribution to democracy. <laughs> democracy requires so much more than that. <laughs> to be a serious citizen of great substance and content, you got to be involved on a number of different levels. Now, I happen to be a social movement person. So I like to keep track of the social movements, you see. Mm -hmm. Occupy movement, what are they saying? 1% own 42% of the wealth. Top three individuals have wealth equivalent to the bottom 160 million. All oh, those crazy folk out there next to Wall Street, why don't they take a bath and go on the home and go to school? No, they raising some issues. <laughs> then here come Brother Bernie mm -hmm. with an electoral political system. Raise the same issues. Four years ago with Brother Bernie, of course, we hit the, we hit the country. We must have done over 150 events together. And uh, they thought we had lost our mind. <laughs> it's true. We were in Seattle just nine years ago talking about $15 an hour, and they called us communists. I said, no, I'm a Christian, but you call me anything you want. Don't make no difference to me. He said, $15 an hour. Mm -hmm. You're talking about free tuition, public institutes of higher learning. Now it's called elimination of debt. Now it's interesting because the Democratic Party has a number of candidates, many of whom begin where Bernie ended four years ago. <laughs> you see, that's what it means for a politician to be a thermostat rather than a thermometer. <laughs> see, most politicians just reflect the climate of opinion, especially after they've studied the polls. <laughs> <laughs> Some politicians shape the climate of opinion like a thermostat. That's what Brother Bernie is able to do, but Bernie didn't do it by himself. It was the Occupy movement. Black Lives Matter the same way. You got Black Lives Matter movement under black president, black attorney general, and black homeland security. Mm. What does that mean? Courage is not a function of skin pigmentation, is it? Mm -mm. You need something more than just being beautifully black. I love beautifully black people. Clarence <laughs> Thomas is beautifully black. <laughs> I keep track of that Negro. <laughs> I keep track of him. He's a beautiful <laughs> black man. And if the police is beating him up, I'm on his side against the police. But as soon as that's over, <laughs> I'm gonna keep that Negro accountable. 96% he sided with the wealthy and the powerful rather than the everyday people. That's a moral issue. It's a spiritual issue. It's not a function of skin pigmentation. And we have to say it over and over and over again so people think that somehow this magic of blackness hmm. makes you inherently progressive and courageous. Well, you say, what kind of history book you been reading? Hmm. And yet at the same time, you have to acknowledge that blackness is so thoroughly degraded and hated and treated with disgust in a white supremacist civilization. Right. So you have to be able to keep track of the love of self and the love of human beings who are Africans and of black pigmentation and still by keeping track of their humanity recognize they can be thugs and gangsters too. Well. That they can be cowardly, they can be complacent, they can be complicitous with structures of domination. And we in America, I mean, we gotta be honest about it and this is part of our problem these days, you know, that uh, it's been often said by the great F.O. Matheson that America is unique among nations to move from perceived innocence to corruption without a mediating stage of maturity. <laughs> Very powerful statement. Very powerful statement. Because America as an empire, like the Persian Empire and 
the Roman Empire, oh my God, the British Empire, Austro-Hungarian Empire, Ottoman Empire. America has been an empire. It is an empire in decline and decay. And if it does not regenerate itself and learn and listen from the best voices, it will go under like any other empire. America does, God does not look on America and somehow give us a nice little nod <laughs> and say, I'm always for you. You my special ones. You my chosen people. <laughs> no, you don't follow through and do justice like any other empire. You lose your empire. You lose the best of it. <laughs> and that's a fundamental fact. And these days with, with the candidates like Brother Bernie, for it was true for, for, for Sister AOC and others. Oh, America's going to go socialist. Well, look, let's look at this now. <laughs> the Pledge, Pledge of Allegiance, written by a Democratic Socialist, Francis Bellamy. The song, America the Beautiful, written by Catherine Lee Bates, Democratic Socialist. America's greatest poet, Walt Whitman, Democratic Socialist. America's greatest philosopher, John Dewey, Democratic Socialist. Greatest Christian social ethicist, Reinhold Niebuhr, Democratic Socialist. Martin Luther King Jr., I ain't even got no language for that brother, <laughs> ends up Democratic Socialist. Helen Keller, <laughs> deaf, mute. Blind, graduate of Radcliffe, Democratic Socialist. We can go on and on. We ain't got the Jack London from Oakland yet. Oh. We ain't got the Harry <laughs> Bridges yet. And we ain't got to agree with everything about them. But Democratic Socialism in its varieties is as American as apple pie. Mm. As apple pie. But the claim is, anytime you talk about socialism, you must be talking about the Soviet Union, you must be talking about China under Mao, and so forth and so on. No, that's not just American ignorance, and we saw it with Lindsey Graham. You all see Lindsey Graham the other day? <laughs> that was the Donald Duck version of Joseph McCarthy. <laughs> that's what that was. It was a cartoonist version of the hysteria charging against communists like Harry Bridges and others. That's what it was, Robeson, Du Bois, all of them. Angela Davis, across the board. But it's not gonna work for the younger generation the way it did in the 1950s. You ain't gonna get a black list of, of, of Hollywood. You're not gonna get professors who were pushed out of their jobs across the board the way you did in the 1950s. You're not gonna send Claudia Jones to London because she's a member of the Communist Party. Hmm. That's played out. That's over, but they're trying to use the same playbook because if they can just charge anybody with being a communist, somehow you're dismissed. And I must say, anytime people call me a communist, I say in the name of Jesus, thank you for the compliment. <laughs> thank you. Because I can tell you my critique of communism when it's tied to domination and repression and regimentation, but I can tell you anybody who falls in love with the struggle for poor and working people in their various ways and they're willing to sacrifice, they are significantly comrades to the degree to which they are willing to bring critique to bear on the powers that be. And so in that sense, we ought not to be afraid and scared and intimidated. And that's crucial because the history of the black movement is to keep people's, black people so, keep us so afraid and scared and intimidated, laughing when it ain't funny, scratching when it well. don't itch, wearing the mask, always trying to fit in, well adjusted to injustice. Oh, we just can't wait to fit in and get white approval and white recognition and the white pat on the back. Oh, is that what makes you feel good? You think that's? What Louis Armstrong was blowing in his horn for white approval? He wanted the cash, but he knew the standards had something to do with Buddy Bolden. Mm -hmm. You think Sarah Vaughn sang the way she did just for white approval? Mm -hmm. You think that Manuel Scott and Gardner Taylor preached the way they did because they want approval from white mm -hmm. pastors on the vanilla side of town? You better get off the crack pipe. <laughs> get off the crack pipe. <laughs> oh, we got some internal standards of the highest folk. You think grandmama loved you as a black child in order to get white approval of you? Then you never understood who grandmama really was. She loved you because she knew you were precious, irreducible. No comparison to you. And lo and behold, there's a tradition of that that goes all the way, it ain't got nothing to do with putting anybody else down. Mm. It got everything to do with putting you up 
in this society where the systems, the structures are geared and designed to put you down. Here's some self-respect. Here's some self-determination. Here's some self-love that is a counter voice against what is in place. Now, that, to me, is the starting point. And that's why it's spiritual as well as moral. That's why it's moral as well as political. It's political as well as economic. It goes hand in hand. But we must never compartmentalize it and think that we got our artists over here in this corner. Isn't it nice that they provide such soothing entertainment? No, uh -uh. if they're not stirring your soul, if they're not fortifying you for struggle, then it is superficial entertainment. But that's not the truth for the great artists that, that come out of our tradition. So, so I guess before I move to the next one, I guess yeah. uh, all I heard is Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that is that the only is that? That's, you, you know you're in San Francisco, right? Oh, like, uh, yeah, I know I'm in <laughs> California. No, it's true. It's true. But what I was saying was is that, you know, I, 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 I love my dear brother Bernie, but all I was saying was, you know, we, 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 we've got to be, we've got to be critical supporters of those in the electoral political system. You see, I'm glad to see Sister Harris run. She's brilliant. She poised. I, was lo I loved how she tried to render Brother Biden accountable the other day. Mm. It's going to happen again. <laughs> it's going to happen again, you see. Yeah. But I'm not convinced that my dear sister Harris has consistently been progressive and on the side of poor and working people in the same way Bernie has been. Mm. You see. Now, I have a lot of good friends, especially my, my, my AKA sisters and others. So, yeah. oh, I understand. I lift every voice. And of course, <laughs> Sister Harris is a zillion miles better than Trump. But I mean, Trump being better than Trump is like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> this bar is about this low, you know. Uh, and, uh, and the same is true with Sister Elizabeth Warren. I have great, great uh, love and respect for her, just like I do, Sister. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Sister, Ooh, tell this you call Bernie that. right here now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about you, brother. I'm talking about you. But I'm being honest. I'm being honest. <laughs> no, that's right. he, he knows I'm critical to everybody, even when I tilt in certain directions. But, uh, uh, but no, but the, uh, but, but, but you know, Sister Elizabeth Warren is, you know, she's strong. There's no, there's no doubt. But I must say this though, that uh, none of the candidates have been able to come to terms with America's empire and the foreign policy in the way that I like it. You see, they don't want to really tell the truth about the Israeli occupation. They don't want to tell the truth about it. Bernie's moving in that direction. We put a lot of pressure on him. And it's a difficult thing because we must always stay in contact with the rich humanity of our precious Jewish brothers and sisters. And we tell them this ain't got nothing to do at our best with succumbing to the vicious, ugly tradition of anti-Jewish hatred that is set at the center of so many Christian and Muslim civilizations. Those are facts that can never be denied. But vicious forms of treating our precious Jewish brothers and sisters must never allow us to hide and conceal the way Israeli occupation can lose sight of precious Palestinian brothers and sisters. And we have to say over and over again, a Palestinian baby has exactly the same value as a Jewish baby. And a Jewish baby has the same value as a Palestinian baby. Neither side has a monopoly of truth, but an occupation is an occupation. Kashmir, Tibet, Western Sub-Sahara, those are all occupations. We have to be honest about that asymmetric relation of power, that structure of domination. That's the beginning, but also in terms of the wars. Mm -hmm. Look at the Democrats' vote for Trump's $750 billion military budget. Wow. Did we hear any major critiques of it coming out of the Democratic Party? Mm -hmm. And this, I know Sister Nancy just right across the way here. <laughs> Sister Pelosi herself, God bless and be with her. And Jesus keep me knit across, God dang it. <laughs> but as Speaker of the House, you see, you got to be able to keep the vision alongside your practical calculations. And if the pr practical calculations begin to truncate some of your vision, then you need serious critique. Same is true with the bombing of Libya, of, of Syria, with the Trump. Trump 
bomb Syria? What do you get out of so many Democrats? Well, he's finally acting like a president. Oh, so that's what presidents do is learn how to bomb, huh? Mm. Oh, that's interesting. Get out of my way with that John Wayne mentality. Mm. This ain't no cowboys versus Indians. I thought, well, we're beyond that. Martin Luther King Jr. died talking about what? Poverty, racism, materialism, and what else? Militarism. Mm -hmm. War. Dro bombs dropped in Libya, Syria, Mali, Niger, Pakistan, Afghanistan, across the board. They land in hoods mm -hmm. with no money for education, no money for health care. Can't find the money. Oh, we got a budgetary austerity we must promote. But we notice when it comes to finding money for wars, all of a sudden it just the money flows like water. Those are the kind of things that need to be addressed. And unfortunately, in most of our presidential uh, 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 discussions or discussions about president, foreign policy hardly surfaces. I don't think mm. there was a serious discussion of it in that last debate. Mm. Not at all. For every dollar spent, 60 cent goes to military industrial complex. Wow. So you got 40 cent to deal with all your other problems. Priorities need to be revamped. You see. And that's one of the ways in which I think we have to keep track of these various politicians. It could be Brother Pete, Brother Corey. You know, I, I've got a great love for Brother Corey. I've known him since he was a student. Brother Pete Buttigieg, his father was like a blood brother to me. Uh, Joseph Buttigieg, his father just just died. In fact, Pete's mother was telling me, she said, you know, Brother West, uh, I'll never forget that you gave Brother Pete uh, uh, five dollars when he was three years old, right inside <laughs> of his, his short pants. I said, is that right? He said, yeah, he got so excited. I said, oh, okay. Now, the thing about Pete is I love him to death like I do Corey, like I do Sister Harris and so forth, but I'm just not convinced that two things, they have the kind of tenacity to be progressive in, when it really gets difficult. And two, I don't think that Trump can be beat unless you can generate such a high level of energy and enthusiasm and vision. But this neoliberal milquetoast-centrism mm. is not going to be strong enough to overcome that right-wing crypto-fascist energy on the, on the right. You got to be able to move people. You got to be able to set them on fire, not with necessarily rhetoric, but with ideas and vision. And one of the things about Brother Bernie, even though he's, he's slightly older brother, <laughs> slightly. Bernie, he got some folk on fire. Mm. And they're on fire for the right reasons, because he has a longevity of consistency and integrity and courage. Oh, he's saying the same thing he did four years ago. You want somebody who's saying something different every four years? <laughs> 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 He's not hitting race hard enough. Let's put the pressure on him. He's not highlighting reparations. Let's put the pressure on him. I'm a reparations man. He's moving in that way. I don't have to agree with everybody on everything. Lift every voice. Hmm. But keep in mind that as crucial as I think reparations are, reparations is not the litmus test for those who are struggling against racism. Within the black freedom tradition, you got some magnificent warriors against white supremacy who did not for reparations. You can't push Thurgood Marshall out just because he wasn't obsessed with reparations. He did more than almost anybody did when it comes to wrestling with that within the legal system. He just started reparations, pie in the sky. Okay, we understand a lot of things pie in the sky, Thurgood. You just keep doing what you're doing. You still a comrade. We just disagree on that. Hmm. In the end, I don't think it's going to be a question of who has the best plan. It's not going to be a question in the end of uh, who's head in the polls. It's going to be who can energize and re revitalize the people in a direction that's over against the kind of gangster leadership and gangster policies of a brother named Donald Trump with a precious mother named Mary Ann who got here in 1930. But I say as a black man who's been here for nine generations, my dear sister, I don't want you to go back. Mm. I don't want you to go back. Come on in the empire and try to make it more democratic. My slave ancestors built the country. Mm. Neo-slavery Jim Crow sustained the country while you came in. 
So if anybody has the authority other than indigenous peoples to define what is an American, mm. you're looking at nine generations of folk who helped build this, but you don't hear from us, go back to where you came from. Because well. we don't stay in the gutter. We don't stay in the moral and spiritual gutter. We know we got gangster elements inside of us, but at our best, we reconquer it every day. We die every day in order to be better persons, more courageous, more critical, more visionary, reaching out to folk all around the country and the world. Welcome, Miss Mary Ann Tr Her name was McLeod from Scotland. <laughs> and we say that to all the white brothers and sisters who get here after one generation and want to be definitive in terms of defining what it is to be America. So left, this is what we do from here. The idea that choice fixes everything is now bankrupt, and we have space to take over the Democratic Party. But don't let them off the mat, because they still have more money than you do. To start priming them now for getting commitments to advocate for government-funded public goods, like water and education. If they try to start talking about market-based solutions or fundraisers or crowd-based solutions, cut them off and say, no, that crap is how you lose elections. We're fighting for government funding. And then ask them to take a seat. Right now, we're trying to grow the party, and part of growing the party means being willing to tell the corrupt part of the party that they need to take a seat. We also need expertise in governing. Start going to meetings, finding allies in government. Learn how the various boards and authorities work in your municipality. If you can join a union, join a union. If you can start a union, start a union. And more importantly, figure out who in government needs to be taken out. We're going to be pushing for minimum wage, affirmative action, universal health care, organized labor, and in general, public goods that support individuals that others don't like to choose. They're going to try to, now the liberals are going to try to say that nonprofits and NGOs are the answer, not a fully funded government politics. Don't fall for it. We have government problems that call for government solutions. Don't let some liberal have you substitute choice for guaranteed goods. Fight for the goods that you are owed and learn how to make claims on your government. They're going to call for unity, but don't fall for it because they want you to unify into an order of domination. Tell them that you'll support unity when they support state-supported, fully funded public goods. Eventually, we're going to need these people, but they're almost pathologically bad at sharing power. So we're going to have to keep them down for a while until they learn that they and their choices are not the center of the world. Where do you want the solutions to come from? Is it from the federal level? Is it from the state level? Is it from nonprofit organizations? I mean, what would you like to see happen that could perhaps resolve this gap? What I, what I propose is essentially funding from the federal government, but selection of projects, implementation of projects, implementation of projects, and hiring of workers at the local level. So think of three sectors in the economy, the private sector, the government sector, which is what most people focus on, but we tend to forget the nonprofit sector, the community organizations. These are organizations that are serving local populations, disadvantaged populations across the country. They've been around for a long time. They know what they're doing. They know the local population. They know the needs of the community. So what we're proposing here is a kind of a federal grant program that provides funding for local community organizations to match the skills of the local unemployed population with the needs of the local community Fair. so that you're hiring the locals and you're benefiting the local community but the funding will have to come from the federal government it can't be local tax money it can't be state funded because only the federal government is financially sovereign and can afford to fund and jumpstart the economy in this way all right good points uh, professor fidel Cabrera. i mean i spend many hours a night answering letters and a fair number of them are from very sincere, very concerned, mostly young people who are asking that question. Can you give me advice about what I should do? I can't stand what's going on. I'd like to do something about it. What should I do? And it's a very frustrating, it's a funny, it's a question which reveals a pathology in the society. The idea that you, have, you should ask somebody who is up on high some, for some reason to tell you what to do. That's not the way it works. You've got to find out for yourself what to do, and nobody can give you advice. It's a, it's a highly personal matter. Uh, you know as much as anyone else does, maybe not on the details about uh, how the economic system works, but you know what matters. Uh, you have choices. We have people like us have, uh, by comparative and historical standards, have an unbelievable uh, amount of freedom and privilege, means plenty of opportunities, uh, which makes it harder because you don't have narrow choices. And you just have to find your own way. I mean, I never gave advice to my own children. And if I had, they wouldn't have paid any attention to it, rightly. Uh, they just found their own ways, very interesting ways. Uh, there'll be a lot of false starts, inevitably. Uh, you can learn from the failures and you try other things. And uh, sooner or later, you find something that works for you. It's not the right, there's no right answer for everyone. It's very different right answers. Lots of things that can be done. So you have to find it for yourself.